Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. They were a young couple with their whole futures ahead of them. She was very good in school, very smart. He was a star basketball player. He was her first real boyfriend. She was on cloud nine. But then she vanished. She walked out of the door and that was the last time anybody had seen her. You start picturing your child alone, scared somewhere. She knew that something was wrong. Tell him, Eric. Detectives search for answers will reveal a shocking truth. This wild story comes out that was never, ever reported. I know she was talking to this guy recently. As a family, it was gut-wrenching. We had this secret of meeting, and it ended up being the most deadly secret that you could have. January 12, 2018. It's a chilly Friday afternoon in Fairfax County, Virginia, a sprawling bedroom community just south of the nation's capital. It's a pretty big county, something like 500 square miles, you know, a million and a half people. It's suburbia. And lots of single family homes, townhomes, condos, things like that. Just a place to raise families. At the home of one Fairfax family, 16-year-old twins, Jolie and Jeanne Moussa, are just arriving home from school. They lived with their dad, and their mom lived in Texas at the time. Their father was out of town, and both girls were supposed to be spending a night at their friends' houses. Jolie was supposed to spend a night at her friend Leslie's house, and Jeanne was supposed to spend a night at her friend Sophia's house. Before their respective sleepovers, the girls spend time preparing for their night out with friends. OK. What do you think of this? It's pretty. I like it. <laughs> they were doing what teenagers do. They were talking. They were gossiping. But to her sister, Jolie seems preoccupied. She was distracted by her phone. Um, hello? Jolie? Sorry. Sorry. Her sister's not really sure who she's talking to, but she's answering messages. And you said you like this all right? Then, after several minutes of texting back and forth, Jolie's phone suddenly rings. Hello? All right, I'm coming. I'll be back. What? Where are you going? She grabs her jacket, and she has her phone, and she walks out of the door. Jolie! Jolie Musa and her twin sister, Jeanne, were inseparable as kids. Obviously, being twins, they were super close. I mean, they had their own language. They were joined at the hip. You see one, you see the other. If you didn't see them together, it was a rare occasion. Their bond was very strong. Sometimes they wouldn't even speak, and you could see that they were talking to each other, and then they both laugh. And you'd be like, what's happening? They definitely loved each other and were always there to support one another. However, as close as the sisters were, they weren't the same. Each had her own distinct personality. As they got older, they still hung out together, but they had different friends. Janae and Jolie always shared the same friends for the most part growing up, but I saw how they were kind of like branching off and finding a sense of independence. Jolie wanted what she wanted, and it had to be done that way, the right way. Jeanne was more of a laid-back twin. Jolie's drive served her well in school. She was a very determined child, very determined to succeed. She had purpose, and she knew off early what she wanted to do. 
She wanted to go to NYU and she wanted to become a writer. I know that you write. She wrote music, she wrote poetry, she wrote stories. She wanted to publish her book that she was writing. She was a very creative person. Jolie loved to write her own lyrics and just sing her song. <laughs> There was nothing that Jolie couldn't do if she set her mind to. She was going to accomplish great things. However, by Jolie's freshman year at Mount Vernon High, there was something else vying for her attention. A 17-year-old classmate named Nebu Ibrahim. The first time I heard Jolie mention Nebu, she mentioned him as a boy that was in one of her classes that wouldn't stop staring at her. But she thought he was really cute. Jolie, do you know him? No. He played basketball. He had a lot of friends, and he was very popular. See, walking over here. <laughs> we'll catch you later. Bye, guys. Hey. Hey. Once Nebu and Jolie started talking, she realized they had a lot in common. He was a, enrolled in advanced classes, was on track to go to college, not a troublemaker or anything like that. He was a good kid. You know, he was very respectful. He was very mannerable. He was Ethiopian, so, the, you know, he grew up culturally slightly different. You got honest English next period? Yeah. Can I take it? Sure. So, uh, like Nebu was her first boyfriend. She had, like, you know, crushes on guys, but, you know, before in middle school and stuff. But when Jolie first started dating Nebu, she was on cloud nine. She was always happy. Everything is butterflies and rainbows. He provided her with a little extra attention, made her feel special. She just really loved him, and she felt she could talk to him about anything. She was happy. Everything was great. But now, hours before their planned sleepovers, Jolie has rushed out the door with little explanation. Jolie was doing her hair and playing on her phone. In, in the middle of doing Janae's hair, Jolie said, I'll be right back. I'll be back, OK? And she grabs her jacket. Where are you going? She gets a phone call, and then she gets up and leaves the house. Jolie didn't come back, though. Her sister isn't initially alarmed. There was a plan for her to go to a friend's house and spend the night. So when she doesn't come back, I think initially the thought is, hey, she probably went to her friend's house. But Jolie's sister will soon have reason to worry. Later on that evening, she received a text from Jolie saying, I'm going to go to a party down in Norfolk. Norfolk was three hours away. It was near Old Dominion University. It didn't make sense. That's not what Jolie would do. For her to just get in the car with whomever and just go out of town. They definitely believe that she's been taken against her will in some way, shape, or form. They, they do not believe in any way that she just walked away and didn't come back. Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. Sixteen-year-old Jolie Musa was destined to achieve big things. Jolie wanted to become a writer. She was very focused on that. She pretty much had her life mapped, which was very unusual for a 16-year-old. But on the evening of January 12th, 2018, Jolie has suddenly vanished. She was doing Janae's hair. She got a phone call, and she said, I'll be right back. And she walked out of the door. And then there's this message that comes from her phone saying something about going to a party at Old Dominion University down in Norfolk, a long distance away. That's really out of character for her. The sister tried to contact her again, even after that text, kind of like, what are you talking about? And no response. Despite that, Jolie's sister, Jeanne, doesn't contact her mother in Texas 
or her father, who's out of town on a business trip. Jeanne knew from the original plan that she was going to stay at her friend's house locally, have a sleepover. But the next morning, after arriving home from her friends, Jeanne gets a disturbing call from the friend that Jolie was supposed to be with. Hello? Hey, Jeanne, have you seen Jolie? What do you mean? What, does she staying at your house? She never showed. The sleepover never happens. Have you tried to call her? Yeah, a bunch of times, but it's like her phone is off now. Zane knew that something was wrong. Not being able to reach her by phone and not knowing where she is was alarming. Worried about her sister, Jeanne contacts her uncle, who lives nearby. Jeanne. He was going to take care of them for the remainder of the time that their father was out of town. It's Jolie. She was staying at Leslie's, and she hasn't heard from her. What? We know she had walked out of her own free will. The family had a ring video, so there's video showing her leaving the house. You can see on the camera her walking away with her phone and her jacket on, and that's it. We don't know where she was going, who she was talking to, none of those things. And that really starts to panic buttons that morning, because now they realize, OK, she's been gone for actually quite, quite a long time, and we have no idea where she is. Once Jolie's sister fills her uncle in on what's happened, he reaches out to the twin's mother in Texas. Hello? What do you mean she's missing? I was scared because it was so out of character for her to just drop off the face of the earth. Understandably, Jolie's mother couldn't help but to fear the worst at that point. She's 16, she's beautiful. She leaves of her own free will. We don't know who she's talking to or what happened before that. At the time, there were a lot of young black ladies that were being taken, you know, uh, human trafficking, sex trafficking. People think it doesn't happen, but it does. So that's definitely a fear that something could have happened to her, that she could have left and someone could have trafficked her. I've seen it happen before, and I've interviewed mothers who've lost their kids. Desperate to find their daughter, both of Jolie's parents rushed to try to get back to Virginia. Her father had to get a flight from California, and I had to get a flight from Texas. While Jolie's parents anxiously await their flights, they do what little they can to aid in finding her. They put every effort into trying to find her, calling people. My first thought was, let's get her face out there. I was emailing news outlets with all of her information so that people know how she looks. So if they see her, they can, you know, report it. That was like my main concern. Jeanne and her uncle also go to the Fairfax County Police Station to file a missing persons report. The family reports her last whereabouts, you know, how she left the house, her phone number. We knew what she was wearing, and we knew the exact time she left the house, so we wanted to make sure that we gave that information. Not that the detective taking the report seems all that concerned. They thought she was a runaway. Let's give some time. She might come back on her own. It was very frustrating, to say the least. Look, man, you don't understand. She's just 16. She wouldn't just run away. She came from a very solid family. She had a good life, a really good life. I'm going to call her mother. She'll tell you the exact same thing I just did. When police reach Jolie's mother, who's still waiting at home for her flight, she's adamant that her daughter is in danger. A runaway? The police were telling me that she was a runaway, and I couldn't shake that my child would have not done this. There's no reason to leave. My daughter? No, no way. She was happy. Run from what? Or was it possible Jolie's mother was asking the wrong question? Okay. Rather than what Jolie was running from, maybe it was more of a question of who she was running with. Did she date anyone? Everybody looks to the boyfriend. That's the first thing that you do. Jolie's mom tells police that her daughter had been dating a classmate named Nebu Ibrahim, but not anymore. She broke up with him. And the reason for the breakup added new urgency to the investigation. I told him that Nebu put his hands on my child. Stop, Nebu!
Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. Police in Fairfax County, Virginia, have just learned that missing teen Jolie Musa recently broke up with her boyfriend, Nebu Ibrahim. I told police about Nebu when we were filing the report. Jolie broke up with her boyfriend a few months ago, and it was bad. According to Jolie's mother, her daughter broke up with Nebu in September, not long after the start of her sophomore year. And shortly after the breakup, the two had a heated encounter. At that time, Jolie and Nebu were going to the same school. On her way home, she encountered Nebu, who was waiting for her. Hey, we need to talk. I don't want to. Stop. He wouldn't take no for an answer. Now until you talk to me. Stop, Nebu. He confronted her, and during the course of the argument, he got physical. She ends up on the ground, lying on her back. Nebu jumped on her and started to hit her. You playing with Stop, me? Nebu! He ended up slapping her in the face. Jolie's screams attracted the attention of a man nearby. Hey, you leaving me? I kicked your hands off her. Nebu left. Police were called and talked to Jolie about what had happened. Never went emergency. Hey, yeah, I think I just uh, witnessed an assault. I heard about it first from her father that same day. And when he told me, I felt extremely angry. I am very much a mother bear. So I was upset. I wanted to get on a plane and go at that moment. The family pressed charges, leading to Nebu's arrest for assault. He goes to the juvenile court, and he pled guilty to the assault. And he was sentenced to perform 20 hours of community service to undergo a mental health evaluation and follow any recommended treatment, and that he needed to complete an anger management program. He's given a chance of having everything off his record if he's of good behavior for a year and has no contact with Jolie. And that was important to the family, no contact. Because we had a stay away order, that would mean that he would have to leave their school. He was sent to another alternative school in Fairfax. Do you think they're staying away from each other? Knowing that she was a teenager, he's a teenager, they might have been sneaking out to see each other. Jolie's mother is adamant that isn't the case. I had just asked her, and she was like, no, no, no. There was no contact of any kind. And now that she's missing, I don't know anymore. Based on what they've learned from Jolie's mother, Detectives pay a visit to the missing teen's ex-boyfriend. Due to their past history, police went to talk to him. It's literally just, hey, let's go talk to the boyfriend and see if he's seen her, see if he has any information that might help us figure out where she is. However, Nebu has little information for the detectives. Have you been in contact with Miss Jolie? No, sir. He's saying that he hasn't talked to her in quite some time that he had gotten in trouble, and he had been told to stay away from her, and he, hadn't, he hasn't seen her. He hasn't talked to her. You have any idea where she is? I have no idea. He never really wavered. Unwilling to take Nebu at his word, given his history with Jolie, detectives ask if they can search his cell phone. But there is no indication that he had been in contact with her, not on the afternoon she disappeared or any time before that. Detectives and a CSI tech also perform a quick search of his residence. And that was a dead end. There was nothing that came from that. Nebu, an apparent dead end. The next morning, detectives circle back to Jolie's parents, who are now both in Virginia. Is there anyone else you think we'd look into? I can't think of anybody. Jolie didn't have enemies. But Jolie's sister, Jeanne, does say that there is someone else the detective should talk to. 
I know she was talking to this guy recently. Do you have a name on it? I only know his first name. Her sister said, oh, I remember just being around her and, you know, she would be texting and the person was named Gio. Have you ever met him before? No. What else did she tell you about him? Not much. I didn't want to be nosy. They were really close, but they had to give each other a little bit of space. But now detectives wonder, could the mysterious Gio be the key to finding Jolie? If the last relationship she's in is this Geo person, that was something that had to be followed up on. We were trying to find out who this individual was. Maybe she went with him to Old Dominion University for this party. Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. Forty-eight hours after Jolie Musa disappeared, detectives searching for the missing teen have a new lead. I know she was talking to this guy recently. I only know his first name. Her family and friends bring up the name Gio. According to her sister, Gio was a boy Jolie had been trading texts with recently. This person has contact with Jolie, so we need to get in touch with this individual to find out if he knows anything. Hoping to learn more, Detective subpoena Jolie's phone records. Does she have a contact named Gio? Who does she talk to all the time? Then, while waiting for Jolie's cell provider to respond, detectives reach out to the FBI and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They're chasing every possibility of any, you know, criminal activity that's happened recently where someone's been abducted in investigating a missing juvenile. And then trying to use that information to find her alive. I mean, that's the hope. With each passing day, Fairfax police become increasingly concerned for Jolie's safety. There were some pretty big red flags. From the day that she goes missing, her social media pages go dormant, which is very, very odd for any teenage girl. She hasn't instituted any communication back to her family. She hasn't voluntarily come home. Still, Jolie's family remains steadfast in their commitment to find her. We were canvassing areas with flyers and just going out and talking to people throughout the area. We were just going crazy, basically, trying to figure out where she could possibly be. I had no intentions on stopping it. I was hoping against hope, until I hear otherwise. And when detectives receive Jolie's phone records a few days later, they finally have what appears to be a solid clue. One of the last phone calls, it's an unknown number. When detectives look up the number, they learn that it belongs to a 13-year-old boy named Eric Brand. Later that afternoon, detectives contact Eric's parents and ask them to bring him in for an interview. We want to talk to you about the phone call you made to this girl. Because shortly thereafter, she went missing. I don't even know what you're talking about. He was terrified. (laughs) He was terrified. I don't even know who this girl is. How do you explain her number in your phone? Eric says that on the Friday afternoon before Jolie disappeared, he'd been hanging out in a nearby park. He said an older boy approached him and asked him for a favor. All I did was let this guy borrow my phone. He had seen him before, so he was okay lending him his phone. Do you know his name? No. What do he look like? Strong guy. Scary looking. The description doesn't match Nebu, but could it be Geo? The detectives didn't even know what this Geo guy looked like. Whoever he was, Eric is able to confirm that the older boy did meet up with a girl. Did you see the girl? 
Yeah, I saw her. What did she look like? Pretty, light-skinned, older than me. He described what she was wearing, and that matched the description of what Jolie was wearing when she left the house. His story gives detectives what appears to be a solid lead. Whoever this older kid was, he seemed to have been the last person with Jolie before her disappearance. Is he the mysterious Geo, or could he be someone else? The general investigation section did some extensive interviews of anybody that they could track down, meaning friends um, and family members, trying to get as much information as possible. But detectives soon hit a wall. The more we look into Geo, the more it just seems like there is no Geo. We can't find anything that would indicate that this Geo is a real person. However, while talking to Jolie's friends, detectives do find a young woman named Elena Merritt. And what she tells them will turn the case upside down. This wild story comes out that was never, ever reported to the police. According to Elena, Nebu and Jolie had never really stopped communicating. Nebu has been in contact with her through social media, through third parties. Jolie had even told Elena that Nebu blamed her for his transfer to the alternative school. To him, it was a big deal. It was a very big deal. He's really angry about not being able to hang out with his friends and play basketball. So in early December, according to Elena, Jolie agreed to meet with Nebu to try to talk things out. I think she wanted to break it with him and have kind of a clean break. But things hadn't gone as Jolie planned. Elena tells detectives that later that evening, Jolie had shown up at her house covered in bruises. They had argued about their relationship. He got very angry. She describes him just putting his hands around her neck and, and squeezing. She thought she was going to die. She had told him to stop, but he wouldn't stop, and she passed out. By the time Jolie came to, Nebu was gone. We just realized that at this point, she's most likely deceased, and he's probably at fault for it. But where's the proof? The answer comes a few days later, when Eric Brand returns to the police station. Tell him, Eric. I wasn't totally honest with you the first time we talked. It was a bombshell. Everything starts to come out. And that's when our suspicion came to reality. I didn't want to believe that that type of evil existed. Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. Detectives investigating the disappearance of 16-year-old Jolie Musa have just uncovered potentially damning information about her ex-boyfriend, Nebu Ibrahim. We had evidence at that point in time that he had strangled her a month prior. And now the 13-year-old who had seen Jolie on the evening of her disappearance has just come forward with another shocking revelation. He admitted that the initial description of the person who he saw with Jolie was incorrect. I'm sorry I lied, but the guy said he'd pay me. He communicated to that witness, hey, if the police ask, don't tell them you saw me. The witness's new description leaves detectives with little doubt about their suspect's identity. The description that the young man gave matched Nebu. And then we had him being seen with a girl that matched Jolie's description on the day that she disappeared. That put Jolie and Nebu together after he had told the police that he hadn't seen her for days and hadn't talked to her for days. Yes, sir. So that witness is basically showing that, that Nebu is a liar. Detectives suspect 
he may also be a killer. He had choked her before and made her pass out. However, they didn't have any evidence that Nebu killed Jolie this time. We don't have a body. But they did have an idea of where to find one. On January 26th, Fairfax County authorities descend on the park where Jolie met up with Nebu. The next logical step is to actually do a physical grid walk of this park. Hey, guys. Just off one of the trails, an officer spots what appears to be a boot protruding from a pile of leaves. They had a body that was partially covered with leaves and debris. Jolie Musa is no longer missing. While the coroner's team removes Jolie's body for autopsy, detectives face the grim task of informing the family that Jolie is dead. It was horrible for them. When Detective Byerson told us that Jolie's body was found and it was her, I remember hearing the news and then I just remember being in a lot of like physical pain. I never understood the term heartbroken, but you physically feel like your heart is broken. We didn't want to find her like this, but we found her, and now we have to figure out what do we do from this point on. When detectives received the autopsy report the following day, the findings reveal exactly how Jolie had died. They found the hemorrhages in the brain that you would find from strangulation. The autopsy is more than enough to convince detectives that Nebu is Jolie's killer. Knowing that he had done that before obviously was a factor in our believing that he was the person responsible. Detectives suspected that this mysterious Geo was simply Jolie's cover name for Nebu. However, while detectives are certain they found Jolie's killer, will it be enough to convince a jury? The hardest thing you have to do is tell a family that you're not sure that you will ever be able to bring their daughter's murderer to justice. And that's where we were at at that time. If we were to go to trial and what we have now, we would probably lose. We needed more evidence if we were going to prosecute him. However, the investigators have a strategy to overcome that. They decided to charge Nebu for assault for the earlier strangling incident, the one where Jolie passed out. If he's convicted of strangulation, that, along with the prior assault in September, could be used as pieces of evidence in a subsequent murder conviction. And so it was very important that we had this strangulation conviction. And then shift our focus to a murder charge and, you know, really seek justice for Jolie. Investigators feel confident they have the evidence to convict Nebu for the December assault. We're actually able to track down some social media messages that he made to a friend of his admitting to that strangulation, and even more disturbing, admitting that he believed that he had killed her. Once the prosecutors explain their plan, the family agrees to go along. We both had the same objective, literally the same objective. I want him to be convicted and put to the full extent of the law. And they were like, OK, well, that's what we want to. This family was so gracious and so helpful in every step of the way. I can't speak highly enough about them. It was so humbling, the trust they gave us. On January 30th, 2018, detectives placed Nebu under arrest for the December assault. Detectives also took a sample of his DNA. By being able to lock him up, provided us additional time for some of the lab results and stuff to come back. We offered a plea to the defense in that case on the strangulation case. He agreed to do that. He pled guilty on the strangulation. He was deferential to the judge. He put on the remorseful act. Yes, sir. No, sir. I'm sorry. I've learned my lesson. But when detectives receive the DNA results, it's clear that Nebu has a harder lesson coming. We got DNA evidence that put Nebu's 
DNA around Jolie's neck. He's going to have to explain that in some way, shape, or form. At the end of August 2018, when Nebu is released from jail on the assault charge, the detectives are waiting. As he leaves the jail complex, I inform Nebu that he's under arrest for the murder of Jolie Musa. They took him to the police headquarters, had him sit down. We knew we were on our way to getting justice for this murder. Our case is solid against him. They advised him of his Miranda rights, made it clear, you know, you don't have to talk to me. And Nebu immediately was like, OK, you know, I, I want to talk to you. All right, so let me tell you what really happened. Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. After his arrest for the murder of 16-year-old Jolie Musa, her ex-boyfriend Nebu Ibrahim says he's willing to tell detectives what happened. All right, I'm gonna tell you what happened. For a homicide detective, that's gold. You want to have that confession. I wasn't sure. Nebu begins by admitting that he had been in contact with Jolie on the Friday that she disappeared. He goes to this park area. He approaches someone that he knows from around the neighborhood, and he uses that person's phone to call Jolie and to contact Jolie to get her to come out to meet him. What did you expect to happen? I really wasn't sure, but I know it was going to get bad. Filtered that through the context of having previously choked her to the point of passing out. So I believe to this day that he embarked on this mission to kill her that he knew exactly how bad it would get, as evidenced by the fact that he leaves his phone at home. Whether he intended to kill Jolie or not, Nebu admits that when they met up in the park, things did become heated. The argument itself got, by his own description, very loud. He blames her for his life getting turned upside down. He's extremely angry about this. You ruined my life. I can't go out with my friends. I can't play basketball. He blamed her for the things in his life not going as he planned them. His anger just built in him for months on end, and he refused to take responsibility for his own actions. Whose fault is that? Yours. It's just shocking to me that he had no self-awareness, that he just chose to kind of go down the, the path of blaming others for his woes. He was mad that she was just going to walk away from him and continue her life. Because they were no longer at the same school, I think he had a lot of suspicion that she was seeing other guys at Mount Vernon. He was a very jealous individual, very controlling. I think control was important to him. And plus, I know you out here being a I'm not seeing anybody. We're done. Nebu says that when Jolie stormed off, his anger boiled over. That puts him into a rage. He gets so angry, puts her in MMA-style chokehold. He gives us a rough time estimate of maybe a minute or two that he holds this. He had every opportunity to stop. But Nebu kept going. He lays her down on her back on the trail that he straddles her so he's literally sitting on top of her. And then he shows us how he takes both of his hands and puts them around her neck and squeezes and continues to strangle her. He's over her at one point, looking down at her face as he's doing this. Strangulation is a very intimate form of murder. Did you ever consider stopping? Yeah. But I kept going anyway. He describes this with no emotion, no remorse. He proceeds to end her life. And 
literally take her last breath from her. And if this can't get any more horrible, he then describes a third strangulation where he picks up her lifeless body, scoots behind her, and puts her back in that original MMA-type chokehold for an even longer time. After that, I knew I had to get rid of the body. He describes picking up her lifeless body to move her off the trail. He covered her with leaves so that she wouldn't be discovered. And you sent the text to her sister? Yeah. He sent the text because he wanted to buy himself time. Then he tossed Jolie's phone in a pond that was nearby his house. Once his confession is over, Prosecutors charge Nebu with first-degree murder. First-degree murder is premeditated murder. And his statement lent itself to first-degree murder. He said he knew he could stop, and he didn't. And he said he was going to end it. If that's not premeditation, I, I don't know what the definition of it is. Once Nebu's booked back into the Fairfax County Jail, detectives inform Jolie's family that her killer has been caught. When I got the phone call stating that he had confessed, I remember crying, just like profusely. I mean, like, I think I may have even hollered a little bit. There was like a weight that lifted up off my shoulders. While Jolie's family breathes a sigh of relief, the walls close in around Nebu. In Virginia, at the time, if you were over 14 years of age and were charged with murder, you were going to be tried as an adult. We just had a rock-solid case on the murder. He wanted to plead guilty. And we said, OK, understanding there is no agreement as to sentence, you're basically throwing yourself upon the mercy of the court. I think he thought by pleading guilty, he might get some favorable reduction in his sentence. At his sentencing on September 4th, 2019, Nebu does everything he can to sway the judge's decision. He was crying and, oh, I, I'm sorry to the family, and this is why I'm pleading guilty. But when it's her turn to speak, Jolie's mother is having none of it. I said, don't let him fool you like he fooled me. He's a sociopath and he is a murderer, and he took my child's life for no reason. And a mother's word makes the difference. And ultimately, the judge did sentence him to life in prison. I am extremely happy that he got the maximum. But no sentence will ever make up for the loss Jolie's family endures. We don't get to see her grow up where her life could have led her. Like, those things were taken from us. There's nothing about her that I, that I don't miss. Jolie was a lovely person with an absolutely beautiful soul and a big heart. And Jolie is still with me. I carry her with me, and she's still my child, whether she's on this earth or not. Abuse is never OK. If you or someone you love is in an abusive relationship, there is help available. Call the Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE.